So welcome all to Europark webinar. I was talking uh, alone for minutes now. I'm sorry for that. I didn't realize you couldn't hear me. But now we are ready to go. So um, you have all answered the poll. Thank you for your answers. I have also shared the answers with you. So I guess you were able um, to see that the majority is working for an NGO and you are actually not a member of the Europark Federation. So what I will do first is to quickly introduce you Europark Federation. Uh, my name is Barbara. I am the communications officer of Europark Federation and I will be moderating this webinar today for you. And the Europark Federation is the biggest network of protected areas in Europe. We connect parks from the mountaintops to the seaside and we encompass all kind of protected areas from national parks, regional or nature parks, marine protected areas and also urban and peri-urban parks. But we also include Natura 2000 sites, biosphere deserve, uh, reserves and all sorts of protected areas. And what we try to do is to bring people together um, to share experience and to cooperate. And the Europark webinars are exactly from, um, for, for that. So you can come together once a month and have a deeper insight on the technical aspect of protected area management. We have been organizing since last year a wide range of topics um, from uh, health and protected areas, sustainable tourism, um, and all the webinars are available at europark.org slash europarkwebinars. So if you go there, you can also download um, all presentations from the other webinars, and you can also um, hear the recordings of the webinars. So also this webinar and their presentations will be available under this website after the webinar is over. Okay. Meanwhile, I see that we have over 100 participants already and from all parts of Europe and also from outside of Europe. So we have people from South Africa, we have people from Nepal, from the US. So it's great to see that you are interested in the topic um, and I'm, I really wish you a very fruitful discussion. This webinar um, is a, a special highlight on um, large carnivores. So we will be looking at how, um, what are the good examples of strategies for a better coexistence. And for that, we have invited three people. We have invited Valeria Salvatori. She will set the scene. She has a large experience on large carnivores and she will give us a short overview of the, um, the panorama of uh, large carnivores in Europe. And later on, um, we will hear some good examples from Estonia and from Italy. This webinar is also organized in partnership with the European platform on coexistence between people and large carnivores. And you might have never heard about this platform, um, of which Europark is also a member. But uh, Valeria will not only set the scene, she will also give you an idea of what is the work of the platform. So I wish you a very fruitful webinar and please use your, um, use your chat box to make any questions to all um, participants, to all presenters. Okay, so I'll give now the voice to Valeria. Valeria. Hello, good morning everybody. It's um, it's an incredible to see that the um, the topic is of interest of so many people. Um, I just will give a, a very brief introduction to the topic. Um, today we will be talking about the issues that arise uh, uh, when large carnivores are, um, are present. And as you may know, uh, in Europe, in the last um, few decades, large carnivores have been increasing. Uh, this has been um, uh, the topic of our uh, publication in science a few years ago. And I am a member of the IUCN uh, Task Force of the Species Survival Commission, Large Carnivore Initiative for Europe. We are updating actually uh, at the moment these maps 
um, as a, just an anticipation, I um, can tell you that there are some uh, increases in the in the distribution range of the, of these maps. They will be available in the near future. I would say uh, within a month. But when we uh, talk about large carnivores and their presence, we often have to face um, uh, interaction with human activities. Carnivores, by definition, are predators, uh, and um, most often uh, their presence has an impact on human activities. Human activities can be of different nature. Um, they do not have conflicts with humans because predators are just predators. This is their nature. They do what they, they know uh, how to do best. They predate on uh, available prey. What conflicts is about is uh, among people that think um, differently, uh, that have different opinion and different industry interests involved uh, regarding the, the, the presence of large carnivores. With this, in this respect, the European Commission has launched the um, European platform, uh, uh, European stakeholder platform, in order to um, gather together different um, representatives from, uh, from a variety of, of stakeholders and um, since June 2014, um, the representatives of um, European Landowner Association, Europark, IUCN, WWF, Hunters, uh, both Association uh, CIC and um, uh, FACE, are partners uh, of, of this platform. And they get together in order to share experiences that may serve to improve the coexistence with uh, large carnivores. The activities uh, for the next two years are mainly focused on, on communication activities, thus exchanging uh, um, documents that could serve to improve coexistence, to organize events, uh, both at international and national level, and um, to uh, search for uh, case studies that could provide best practices. Now, when we talk about best management practices uh, in, um, <clears throat> towards large carnivores, particularly in, in uh, densely populated uh, areas, we need to focus on uh, mostly integrated damage management, uh, mitigation of impacts, participatory approaches are very uh, much required lately, conflict resolution strategies and then monitoring and evaluation of any um, activity that, that may be undertaken. All these will be presented today um, from two case studies, one from Estonia and the other one from Italy, where some of these um, activities uh, have been under, are, are being undertaken and we will hear uh, the very interesting results that um, they are achieving. So, at the moment, let me introduce uh, Tony Talby, who is um, uh, part of the Environmental Board of Estonia, who will give a, a very interesting presentation on how um, the, the uh, large carnival presence is managed in, in Estonia. Tony, please. Good morning. Tere päevast, here is Estonia and I will shortly give you a review about uh, this management of relations between, between uh, carnivores and uh, farmers mainly in Estonia. So, I'll give you an overview about this env environment of the things, explain relations and uh, and uh, talk about the, our work or management or some success. The country, it is small, quite sparsely populated. Uh, unfortunately, more and more people live in the urban areas. But anyway, the, the landscape or habitats are 
suitable for different creatures, including uh, large carnivores. The players on the skin, they are three of them, uh, lynx, brown bear, wolf, and uh, of course we have uh, several other medium or small size carnivores also. Shortly about uh, the species, unfortunately during the last decade we had a little bit decreasing uh, population of lynxes in Estonia due to uh, prey status of roide decline in the early of this decade, but now for, uh, hopefully the lynx is recovering. Uh, there are, uh, thereafter we have uh, brown bears on the mainland of Estonia, some uh, 50, 55 breeding uh, females every, every year. And uh, thereafter, the lynx, oh, sorry, the wolf. We have some 20, 25 uh, reproductive packs in the all over the country. And before the hunting season, there are some 200, 250 individuals of, of the wolves. Uh, about the relations of this of these players. Um, yeah, as, as it was uh, uh, always uh, explained, uh, the predators uh, are carnivores. Our wolves mostly depredate on the natural prey in Estonia, which is in, uh, which are in the quite good, uh, quite good, uh, level today, but at the same time our wolves take some 600 and 1000 sheep per year, some cattle, some dogs, some goats and bears. Our bears are mostly interested on the bee hives, the honey, but occasionally they also take some sheep or cattle or are they damaged silage packages in the countryside. Uh, to explain uh, the wolf-sheep uh, wolf uh, relations, as I told to you, we have in the old country some 9,000 to 10,000 uh, sheep uh, in the agriculture, and the number of the sheep and uh, in the countryside and uh, the, the depredated number of the sheep, they are not uh, directly related, but depending on the year, our wolves depredate some five, six hundred to almost one hundred, uh, one hundred, uh, one thousand, uh, thousand uh, sheep per year. But of course, there are some outliers, or some there is some variation. If usually or, or traditionally, there's a depredation rate of the of the wolf in the in the countryside. It is bit, it's some somewhere between 0.6 to 1 percent in the old Estonia or in the big, bigger islands also. There are some outliers, for example, in the last three, four years, we had a new breeding, uh, uh, breeding pack of the wolves in the second uh, biggest island of Estonia on the Hiuma. And uh, in this uh, worse uh, years, we got some 3.5% uh, of the sheep taken on this island by wolves. Or two years ago, we had one one quite phantomic, uh, phantomic uh, wolf on the small island of Muhu, and uh, he takes some four percent of the sheep during the year. So there is a uh, some variation in this depredation. Uh, yeah, at the same time as we 
uh, to, uh, to as we uh, know uh, much more uh, much more uh, sheep are uh, find their end by the other uh, by other reasons as by diseases or parasites accidents or so on but why this uh, depredation rates rates are so, as high as they are there are probably very different uh, reasons as uh, changes in the natural prey numbers or availability of natural prey probably some uh, some changes in the behavior of the, of the large predators and of course what is uh, very important just is uh, we have uh, the changes in the agriculture we haven't more shepherds in the use we have more and more so-called distant pastures where the sheep herds are lived to the distant pastures and we unfortunately we have more and more this so-called project farmers farmers who who didn't uh, keep uh, these traditions bad from the history yeah it is serious serious relations and serious problems of course and uh, and you must manage these relations and then in these relations or, or in this conflict there are always very different parts or yeah very different participants firstly of course uh, carnivores and uh, and farmers as i tried to explain also there are some different interest between carnivores and hunters there we can find you can find here uh, here also some time conflicts or different interest between sheep farmers or and uh, and crop farmers as crop farmers are sometimes interest on the little bit higher carnivore number who regulate the wild ungulates at the same time you understand that sheep farmers are on the opposite position there are this long time practiced uh, how to say con conflict or, or or discussion between carnivore conservation and agricultural subsidy system which is also at least by some part uh, the the part in the in this management and you know or and you understand that always uh, always the the carnivores are very popular in the social media in the ordinary old, or old-fashioned media they are they are it is very easy to manipulate with them and and so on our work and our uh, our topic and uh, and uh, yeah everyday everyday management since uh, 2009 we had the, on the country the state compensation program to work with this damages and uh, compensation of uh, depredation damages and and uh, subsidies all the cases and also the prevention measures uh, are inspected by uh, my colleagues and myself uh, by our trained experts who work in the environmental board of the estonia for the country 100% uh, of the depredation uh, damages are compensated in the estonia there are participated uh, per year some more than the 200 farmers or yeah partners for us and this uh, sums or, or costs we, we we pay for the wolf there is some approximately 100,000 euros per year for the wolf and some half of this sum per, per brown bear plus this uh, subsidies compensation uh, I will I will show you on the site we carefully wrote so-called uh, so-called uh, inspection paper on the place on the place where we fix all the all the things on that as as well as details as possible uh, it is written to the to this inspection or inspe inspection paper inspection paper paper our, uh, our experts we train and uh, educate them regularly regularly and they got very different uh, very different uh, information 
from the better experts in or, or scientists or practitioners in the in the country and uh, of course our aim in this uh, management or, or, or managing in this system is just to improve the practices, to reintroduce different prevention measures, uh, uh, to, uh, to improve the farmers' knowledge, responsibility training, and of course, uh, on the general level or, or on the society level, to educate the uh, general, uh, general community. It is all these uh, different parts, they are very, very important some words about the damage prevention uh, compensation and management uh, we we work with the different uh, prevention measures mostly with the improved uh, fences which surround our our pastures they are mostly we, they uh, the farmers they use use uh, all electric fences system or elect, uh, or ordinary sheep uh, metal fence plus electric uh, extra electric uh, fence wires or or smaller uh, night enclosures and and we had uh, during the last five six years we introduced uh, to the country the livestock uh, guarding dog uh, uh, method or, or practice and uh, from the state uh, part we compensate some 50% from the real costs of compensation. This means that, uh, and the number uh, or the uh, number of subsidies uh, increased during the years, and during the last years it's reached some uh, 70 till 80, 80,000 uh, euros per year, which we pay to the, for the uh, damage prevention measures. Yeah, some some examples or pictures. Uh, they are just uh, just uh, different uh, combinations of uh, electric fences. There is a very important how correctly it is uh, it is uh, built, uh, established this uh, fence system. The same the electric fences we. Uh, or, or, or beekeepers use to protect uh, their beehives or uh, complexes of, of the beehives uh, uh, against the brown bear. And as I told you, we started uh, and uh, established the use of the, of the guarding, uh, guarding dogs. I must note that it, it wasn't a widely distributed uh, practice in the history. It isn't uh, the tradition in, the, in our country, but thanks to several enthusiasts as, uh, as uh, dog breeders and, and farmers, uh, uh, it, is, it was, has been distributed widely and uh, we had a very, very nice uh, results uh, in the use of this uh, uh, dog dog practice and those, of course also we also we uh, we uh, educate uh, or and we prepared uh, some uh, some manual to the to the farmers how to how to use different uh, measures uh, measures of the protection uh, protection measures and as to conclude or to the result uh, there can be use different effective uh, Measures even in the in the Estonian uh, conditions in the hard or, or complicated landscape, uh, and uh, as I will in the next slide, I conclude uh, the better results we we got if the farmers, sheep farmers, they used different methods methods uh, together. Uh, for example. I collected, I've gathered, uh, gathered from the last five five years uh, data, or or from the database, we we managed. Uh, if uh, they, as I told, if they use just traditional fences surround, just traditional uh, uh, metal fences or or two or three wire electric fences surrounding uh, sheep pastures. 
then approximately some between 0.6 to 1% of the sheep are depredated per season or approximately 10 to 11, 12% of the herds are attacked by the, by the wolves. If the farmers or sheep farmers use a, a improved fence or, or suggested by us this so-called improved good electric fence system, then the number of depredated, uh, depredated sheep per country per year decreased some tenfold time, ten time and and also the number of the number of the herds attacked by the uh, or percentage of the herds attacked, uh, attacked by the wolves uh, decrease clearly but if we had uh, very good examples uh, from the pastures or from the farmers from the practice where they used together there's this so-called improved electric fence plus livestock guarding dogs and then we we had very clear very clear decrease of the depredated or on the depredated uh, sheep number or the depredated uh, uh, depredated uh, herd herd numbers so we hope we we continue uh, with this kind of practice and uh, and hope that uh, that the community and uh, as well as uh, sheep farmers follow and and uh, beekeepers uh, follow uh, this uh, cooperation and uh, and uh, continue the reintroduction of different measures reintroduction of the of the traditions and the improvements of measures and uh, also we we hope very much that uh, we can keep this balance in the general community or society, which is, in my mind, uh, my mind very, very important on the general level. So thank you for uh, your attention. It's all I like to told you. Okay, thank you very much, Tono. This was very interesting. Um, we had uh, a national or a governmental level perspective in a country that has several species to manage, and it's not always easy. So thank you all for your comments, meanwhile. Um, I've seen a lot of questions about how you, how you uh, define the attack of a wolf, how, how can, what kind of measures can you use, and especially there was um, a comment from Romania, from Alina, who mentioned that, the reduction, that, that in Romania there is a reduction of attacks using guarding dogs. So, Keeping this in mind, I will now invite you to the second case study, because in the second case study, we will hear not a governmental perspective, but a non-governmental perspective. And they have been working with guarding dogs uh, in Italy. Um, so we should have Luisa uh, some troubles with the sound. Uh, so we have Valeria Salvatori, who also introduced the webinar. Uh, before Tonu, and she was also working in uh, with this NGO and in the project, and she will explain you what are they doing at a non-governmental level in Italy. So, Valeria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I am sorry to to um, be the speaker myself. I would have uh, very much liked to have Luisa um, presenting this. Um, Okay, I will present um, <clears throat> the case study that uh, was uh, prepared by Luisa <clears throat> because I know uh, pretty well, given that uh, we were working together within a live project. Just for the um, uh, setting the scene, um, this this work uh, is um, has been produced within a, a live project, the live medwolf project. Uh, that was undertaken between 2012 and 2017 in two areas uh, in Portugal and Italy that are uh, particularly characterized by rural environments. Um, these are areas where the, the um, woody uh, cover is limited, 
um, it, it's um, it's an area where wolves have been um, returning uh, and increasing in their numbers uh, over the last decades. And it's an area where the local economy is uh, uh, strongly based on um, agricultural practices, namely um, livestock husbandry. <clears throat> the um, uh, objectives of the Life Medwolf project was to uh, mitigate the impact of wolves uh, on livestock produ production, to increase uh, the awareness um, about the, the presence of wolf and its impact on livestock production, and to discourage illegal acts against wolf. We also had um, an um, anti-poison uh, canine team set up. Now, a little bit about Grosseto. Uh, Grosseto is one of the larger provinces in the uh, um, peninsula of Italy, and one where only in 2012 uh, sheep uh, numbers uh, were lower than uh, human numbers. So <clears throat> um, it's particularly um, vocated for agricultural practices. Uh, the lowland were actually um, marshes uh, after the uh, Second World War that were uh, dried up and uh, devoted to uh, agricultural activities. Uh, lately, there is a negative trend in the number of, uh, of sheep, mainly because of, um, let's say, uh, worldwide uh, issues like price of milk and, and meat production. In this situation, uh, any attack uh, by predators uh, could be felt and lived uh, by the sheep owners as an attack to their livelihood. And uh, the Life Medworth project was um, targeting exactly this problem. So <clears throat> one uh, particular action then that uh, we developed within the Life Medworth project was the uh, setting up of an association called Difesa Attiva, which means active defense, um, made of livestock breeders, so that it was not um, ourselves, the practitioners or experts anymore, to promote uh, damage prevention measures, but it was the farmers through their, their own networks who could uh, transfer their, their experiences to um, other farmers, their colleagues. Now, what um, were the challenges that Divesa Tiva had to tackle? Uh, a sense, a deep sense of isolation among the farmers. Farmers felt that they were left alone dealing with this issue because it was a new uh, issue arising um, that the uh, wolf presence was actually uh, not uh, something natural, so that was the perception. And they had no trust in the, uh, in, uh, in the administrations, either local or regional. Uh, may I remind you that uh, in Italy, the wolf management is delegated to regional administrations. And uh, there was um, no habit um, of is either positive or negative among the farmers. So <clears throat> what uh, we thought of uh, doing to tackle these issues was uh, to, first of all, um, promote the use of livestock um, prevention measures. Uh, more intensively, the use of livestock guarding dogs. We used uh, the local breed, the Maremma dog, and <clears throat> train the farmers on the correct use of dogs. We evaluated the behavior of dogs and, and their effectiveness, and we promoted the work that uh, the farms adoptive, uh, adopting damage preventing measures were doing. So we actually created a brand of uh, quality products. Uh, we promoted also, of course, uh, correct communication, trying to um, uh, identify news that were not, um, not right and provide correct uh, information. So this is Luisa that you see in these pictures. <clears throat> and she 
really um, entered the world uh, of uh, livestock owners as uh, as if she was one of them. She has a background of um, um, naturalists. So she she is um, she was a biologist. She worked for uh, ten years for an agricultural organization, and then she quit and she devoted herself to the management of these associations. She became a partner of the livestock breeders. Uh, she shared some of their uh, duties and she learned some of the uh, jargon that they use uh, so that she they started to feel that she was uh, really one of them and working on their side. This was addressing the, the feeling of isolation. <clears throat> the, um, the slogan of the association is, we stand for this we actually do something for addressing the, the issue of livestock degradation. Um, we, uh, it, when we started with the livestock guarding dog um, assignation, we uh, experienced a certain resistance by the farmers. So we started with a, a limited number of farms, those that were more um, open to new uh, tools, and um, we started the, the um, habituation uh, of uh, dogs to their farms and discussions, uh, uh, trying to um, share issues, how to overcome problems and um, try to find solutions. So at the moment, uh, we have um, a Facebook page and a web page where we promote all the activities that we do we have over uh, 1,500 followers and uh, we promote the uh, ecotourism activities whereby we take uh, people uh, on, in areas where presence of wolf has been registered and we take um, them at the end of the path uh, to visit one of the farms that has damage prevention measures to listen to the farms and uh, understand what uh, they had experienced. One of the promotional activities uh, was uh, to um, uh, to offer some uh, tourist packages for, for Christmas. <clears throat> we also have um, some technical assessment of the um, uh, efficacy of um, uh, livestock guarding dogs. We uh, used GPS collars um, in order to assess the, the presence of livestock guarding dogs uh, with respect to the flock they were assigned to. Uh, we evaluated the cost of having uh, livestock guarding dogs in terms of um, uh, food provision and vet care, and we supported the um, livestock owners at least for the first two years. And then we uh, signed a memorandum of understanding with um, institutions uh, inside and outside the um, Tuscany region. At the moment, um, we, when we started, we had three farmers uh, as members of the associations. We have uh, 21 farmers now. Um, we have um, Many dogs that were delivered outside uh, Grosseto province, um, also thanks to the memoranda of understanding that we signed with uh, two national parks, uh, the national, uh, national parks Appenino Tosco Emiliano and um, national parks um, um, uh, Foreste Gasentinesi. We also have a memorandum of understanding with the Unione dei Comuni della, della Garfagnana and we have a branch of the association in Liguria. We also have a, um, an agreement uh, with um, Pastures, which, which is an association based in Lombardy. Um, other activities that we um, uh, started is the project Active Volunteers. This is um, uh, an initiative that was inspired by uh, previous experiences um, that were promoted by Pastor Alou uh, in France uh, first and then by Pastors in, uh, in Lombardy, whereby um, volunteers actually share some of the, uh, the time and tasks with the, um, with the livestock owners and help them in guarding the, um, the flocks. 
Uh, these are the, some of the memorandum of understanding that we have signed, apart for, the, uh, for those that I have already mentioned. We have also um, a national uh, WWF office that signed a memorandum of understanding and a pet food company, Almo Natura, that has uh, provided food for 100 dogs. Um, I don't know why it doesn't go. Okay. Ah, it doesn't show. Um, so uh, what we really feel now is um, about um, the the project and the activities of the uh, association can provide mitigation of the impact. Uh, what we aim at is that um, predation levels might raise levels that can be considered um, business risk by the, the livestock owners. And uh, we um, are promoting our activities uh, within the uh, public authority because we would like uh, them to see us as a uh, best practice uh, example. Uh, we are looking for uh, new opportunities within the Rural Development Funds. Uh, we have already received um, a few opportunities through uh, the Agricultural Association, one of the Agricultural Associations. And I think that uh, Luisa and Francesca, who is the president of the association, would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, thank you also for the questions that you have been writing. You can keep on writing and addressing as well. Uh, yeah. I've seen a I've seen a comment from Constantine who was saying that they haven't found a perfect solution. But what we have heard here today is that probably a combination of solutions might contribute to a better coexistence. And indeed, with this presentation from Valeria, we have seen how they are working or they are creating a network with uh, shepherds where they can come together, they can be listened and they can share experiences. And they are actually expanding the, the livestock guarding dogs um, to other areas of uh, Italy. And all these uh, on a non-governmental perspective. So this is quite inspiring. Um, also interesting is the volunteer um, engagement program. So thank you, Valeria, for uh, mentioning it. Uh, maybe in another webinar we can take a deep look on uh, communication and on uh, how we can engage volunteers and other supporters. So, but now um, let's move on to the discussion. Um, I've seen you have also changed uh, a lot of information. And let me tell you that uh, all the links that have been shared, they will be sent to your emails directly uh, tomorrow uh, with the link for the presentations and the link for the webinar recording. Now, Tonu, yeah. let's go for the first question. Um, so, uh, Katrin, Katrina asked um, that um, yeah. you talked about conflict, manage, conflict between agriculture policy incentives and large carnivores management. Yeah, I tried to explain. I, hello. Yeah, I tried to explain this uh, this uh, pair of of different interests or, or let's say conflict. You see that uh, uh, at the same time we have uh, here uh, uh, here uh, interests clear. Understandable, understand the interest uh, in con carnivore con conservation. At the same time, we had uh, the running, uh, so-called running agri-environment policy, which at the same time, and it is also part of the nature conservation policy that uh, we are in the country. We are interested on uh, restoring and. Uh, managing on the traditional way of traditional grasslands, as well as pastures, as well as meadows. I mean the coastal meadows, wooded meadows, uh, wooded pastures, and so on. 
olivars or, 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 or dry metals on the limestone bedrock, so on. And this means that at the same time, we have a particular, very clear uh, partners who are interested uh, who are interested on the getting uh, with the contract with the bigger as possible grassland territories areas just or to move them or to graze them with the sheep and unfortunately this mean in some time in some cases in some practices this means that uh, this uh, okay in the worse uh, conditions so you can you can refer them as a as a, as a project farmers in worse uh, conditions or cases uh, they just use the sheep as the movers of the grassland and this uh, rise uh, or this uh, yeah there there rise a conflict between the not protected or, or very badly protected uh, sheep herds and the common large carnivores which are common in in the all the country i hope i hope I, uh, that i ans an answered to that question that there is a conflict between the con carnivore cons conservation and between the race for the land contract subsidies Thank you. I and, hope you uh, can see, see. So go on. No, yeah, I, I picked also another another question about the links, but but maybe you like yeah, to comment. Yeah, that's it. That was the second one that I would like you to ask. So, yeah. um, do you have any data graphic about links predation? Yeah, I, we have. Of course, we have a data as we we collect and uh, and and. Uh, Work with uh, all the free species, and uh, but the uh, the part of the is actually very very small one. There are different reasons. So the one is a biological reason or, or behavioral reason that uh, lynx is uh, usually in in our conditions in Estonia they take per night or per per attack only or they damage in most cases only one or or let's say several sheep several individuals this means that uh, that uh, biologically it seems or behaviorally it seems that the lynxes are not just on the damaging or, or playing inside the sheep herd but but they depredate for the for the pups food or or they depredate a single or or small number of the individuals of the sheep and another reason why the lynx uh, uh, depredation rate is, is small very small I later refer to the numbers also the another reason is that the, as I told you in the early of this decade in the winters between 2009, 2010, 2010, 2011, and so, and this, uh, next one also, next winter also, we had very harsh, long, uh, hard winters, winters, and uh, and it's uh, influenced very negatively to the ro roe deer uh, population in, in the country, in Estonia. And as a roe deer, Capriolus capriolus, it is the main, uh, main prey for the lynxes, probably mostly up to this, the, the population or actually the breeding success of the lynx is uh, quite dramatically decreased. The number of the lynx population decreased, decreased uh, almost two times in the two time in the stone and only it is re-establishing again fortunately and uh, probably this also influenced that the, that the number of depredated uh, sheep by the lynxes in the country it is some some uh, 20 30 20 30 uh, sheep per year in estonia this means that if you compare it with the number of the wolf uh, uh, wolf uh, depredated sheep i remember that it was somewhere somewhere between uh, between uh, six six uh, 
hundred and and one thousand, uh, the, the sheep uh, depredation, uh, the lynx depredation is really very very small one. Okay, thank you very much, Tony. I don't know if uh, you have any questions for Tony. Um, I would like you. We have Vera, who have just asked, how would you convince skeptical farmers? Yeah, but actually, actually, in Estonian case, probably this skepticism or or, or absent of the wolves uh, in the Netherlands, yeah, it's it's happened. Uh, how would you convince skeptical farmers? Uh, yeah, I I understand very well your your position and. Uh, uh, and question uh, it is still in in our country in Estonia it still stay in some in some way balance of course of course uh, as well as in the other countries in Estonia we have very 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 um, uh, different interest groups or or interest parties or very contrasting parties uh, as well we have this very green ones who like to uh, like to protect all the carnivores or or every individual and not to shoot anybody and so on and from the another side we had uh, especially in this uh, modern media and in this social discussions we had uh, this kinds of attempts to just to rise uh, rise is very dramatic uh, uh, explaining of uh, very dramatic uh, conditions what we uh, got if we continue with this kind of environmental environment or nature protection uh, nature conservation policy as we uh, do they do that uh, they are talking about the hmm. okay there are very very bad bad or and uh, in my mind, quite stupid talks in the in the media or social media about the attacks to the school children or so, so on or so on, the possible or, or future things. But uh, I I mean that uh, it's very very important to keep this uh, midway or, or, or balance uh, there and until until you have in your country enough of the habitats for the for the nature or for the yeah natural uh, natural uh, species or let's say for the large carnivores as we still have been in our country actually you always can uh, can manage with this kind of discussions or with this kind of uh, fight how to say wars against the wolf or, or bears or so on and uh, and of course in the managing uh, there is a part of this managing uh, system uh, is uh, just uh, limited and uh, controlled uh, hunting uh, hunting regulations and if you succeed with uh, with the hunting management as well for example in the last last two weeks we had uh, several cases where uh, where wolves attacked the dogs in the in the gardens or in the farms and uh, it seems that this local hunting organizations and hunters succeeded to to how to take to take this uh, just this special individuals who attacked the, the dogs and now uh, this kind of uh, signals on this this kind of uh, stories ended uh, and it was it has been also again uh, one one of the quite good example just that you must work with very different tools and always keep this balance and stay in the middle of this uh, middle of the middle of the farmers and wolves let's say so okay yes exactly so a good mediation is fundamental and also in valeria presentation um she really highlighted the working together with shepherds and this might answer some of the other questions um, that were asked uh, besides prevention measures how do you deal with angry shepherds and I would ask Valeria to answer this one 
Yes, um, we of course had angry shepherds. Um, I personally was insulted many times because um, I, I was coordinating the Life Medwood project. Um, how I dealt uh, with them, uh, how we dealt with them, well, first of all, the Medwood project has a unique head, a unique partnership. Um, uh, we uh, grouped together the three main um, agricultural associations and the two main environmental associations. Um, so we sat together trying to uh, reach as many as possible and uh, try to establish direct relationship with them. Um, I um, uh, personally went to uh, see some of the shepherds and also the uh, directors of the uh, agricultural associations went to see them, you know, and, and we tried to um, make them understand that um, I was not in favour of wolves at all costs, you know, uh, uh, particularly in Italy, uh, where the wolf population is um, has increased so much in the last decades. Um, I, I, it was very clear for them that I was not uh, an extreme green person and uh, that they could hold a dialogue with us. Uh, having said so, um, they would uh, keep being resistant in adopting damage prevention measures. And um, what our experience is, is, uh, is that working with the younger uh, shepherds is, uh, is easier because they are not so much rooted culturally with um, what they were used to do. Um, namely, not guarding livestock. So it is um, it is a, a, a big challenge, uh, but uh, let's say confronting them, uh, standing on on a strict position, it doesn't pay much. You have to um, try to let them understand that you understand their problems, you share their concerns. Nevertheless. Wolf cannot be killed, at least in our country, so they ought to be on the legal side. And uh, you may um, vehicle their message to the uh, uh, local authorities and try to sensitize as much as possible the public. Exactly. And Valeria, um, what solution you find um, for this effective? Uh, community education, not directly with the shepherds. We have seen that um, interact with shepherds is fundamental, and especially the younger ones. From your experience, yeah. they work better with. But what what do you think uh, for um, a broader community? Um, yeah. What what tools or what techniques are you using? I've seen someone mentioning citizen science. I don't know if you have any experience on this. No, we didn't use. Uh we we had a great problem with media of course as uh, many of you probably experience um, we organized um, school activities um, and uh, journalism courses so that the, the students uh, were actually taught by professional journalists how to make good quality uh, journalists um, checking for news and interviewing, having direct uh, um, interviews with the interested parties. We um, uh, sensitized uh, the general public through uh, participating at local fairs, uh, local festivals, um, uh, involving people in, in tourism activities, but we, we didn't uh, experience any citizen science activities. We uh, what we try to do is to keep as transparent as possible. Every uh, activities was communicated to the public, uh, to the most relevant uh, stakeholders. Um, when we did the wolf survey, we um, held workshops with hunters, with livestock owners, with environmental guides, and we asked them to uh, collaborate with us. And then at the end of the activities, we presented the results and they were very, very um, positive because they felt that uh, we were giving them um, uh, the, the information that we were collecting. 
Okay. Okay, thank you for this answer. Um, Tono, I don't know if you want to add something on effective ways of community education, but it seems that you are working more at uh, shepherds and farmers level directly and not for the wider community. Is it correct? Uh, I'm a little bit wonder that uh, Valeria referred to that the young, uh, younger farmers or younger shepherds are um, able or are following uh, conservationists uh, management uh, aims or so that uh, in in our case it seems that uh, this really so-called traditional uh, tr tr traditional farmers in in our country or the farmers who keep or who uh, yeah manage the manage the sheep for the production or or they feel the similar feelings or and and follow the similar traditions as their grand grand grandfathers followed uh, this kind of uh, persons i mean the farmers or sheep farmers they are they are with them there is a easier and easier and better to uh, to cooperate or to manage and to work together as uh, they take this uh, this so-called wolf part this 0.5 till 1% of the sheep depredated by wolf this so-called wolf part they take this number quite normally or quite as, as quite normal thing as historically it's happened historically so and it happened today and it's 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 probably it's it's continue continue to happen in the future in in as i tried to try to explain earlier to katrina answering to the katrina quest question uh, explaining the conflict between agriculture policy and uh, and this uh, carnivore management uh, the little bit harder is uh, do to work and to explain uh, the story and uh, and our aims to this uh, so-called uh, project project farmers whose uh, main aim or the main topic is just to graze just to manage manage as as a larger territory or larger area of the pastures or the or the grassland as possible or this means that the, to 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 got the larger agri and environmental subsidy for the grassland management grassland traditional sustainable management and they as i told and i repeat it once more they uh, use mostly sheep as instruments let's say so and they not produce or in most cases, or, or in, well, let's say in the many cases, is, is this correct? In in many cases, they didn't use the sheep farming for the production of the meat, or for the production of the skin, or for the for the production of the or the, the fool, or so on. And in this case, or with the, this kind of the partners or particular partners, it is much more harder harder to discuss or to explain and to yeah, argument. Uh, argument that this kind of uh, uh, different nature conservation interests and uh, and to uh, keep this midway sorry if if it's very complicated or, or non-understandable explanation but I, I try to repeat this this once again okay um, but I will I would like to to shift a bit the the topic of discussion because I've been reading a lot of comments about fear so yeah. we although uh, the examples we had here today they were basically um, prevention measures um, and compensa compensatory measures working directly with farmers and with shepherds we do have a big problem on a general perception of wolves and especially in germany i've i've read some someone saying uh, people are really afraid of wolf come back but let's try to overcome fear and face the facts uh, so this question is for both Valeria and Tono. Um, how many uh, are uh, wolves being aggressive towards humans, or do they keep shy? How many attacks have been going on in your countries? What is your experience? Okay, I start. There. Of course, not any wolf in our case. The last uh, 
documented a, a documented case where uh, where uh, let's say so where normal wolf healthy wolf attacked attacked the the human beings it is documented uh, if i remember 130 years ago in the in the late of the 19th century uh, all the other later later cases in the uh, 19 19 uh, uh, in the mid of the 1980s there were some cases where it was clearly uh, clearly ill ill the wolf as you know we had uh, it is now uh, it is now uh, finished with this uh, illness but but we had uh, uh, as well in the other countries we had uh, sorry what is it? yeah rabies yeah. just just right thank you very much rabies and it is it is documented uh, in the in the i don't now remember the exact uh, year but in the somewhere in the 1985 or 84 when this uh, wolf with the rabies come to wander yeah come to walk to the farm uh, yard and uh, and uh, attack the the elder lady who tried to keep this wolf away from this uh, garden not later any documentings not any attempts not any this kind of stories that uh, that uh, wolves uh, wolves attack the, or or yeah try to do this this is just the tales or real it is it is really so that if they are normal wolves not ill normal and of course if you have the, at least the, on the normal level uh, in the in the nature the natural prey they didn't have any interest against uh, the, the human beings exactly okay um, thank you, Tono. And Valeria, what is your uh, opinion on this? Yes, um, we we have no record of um, uh, wolf attack to humans uh, in the last centuries. So this is um, this is not a record for Italy, but it is a record for Italy that the increasing fear uh, for wolves uh, showing up in urban environments and. Um, we are just now, just now tackling uh, um, a local situation um, whereby people <clears throat> are afraid of um, uh, continue keeping their dogs or their children uh, in their garden. Now, we um, had a, an international conference last week where uh, in Trento, where this uh, was also one of the discussed topics. I would like to remind to everybody that not all uh, approaching wolves are dangerous wolves. Wolves are uh, curious animals. They, they do um, take uh, opportunities where they are uh, offered to them. The important thing is what we um, are currently telling people, not doing uh, things that uh, could be perceived uh, by the wolf as a positive experience in um, uh, being close to humans. This is avoid uh, leaving sources of food, um, avoid approaching them too much, um, do, not, um, uh, do not do anything that could be um, associated by wolves as potentially good. Okay. So um, I think this is an increasingly um, relevant issue uh, all across Europe because we have seen that the uh, wolf, particularly wolf range is expanding. Um, <clears throat> and if I may take the opportunity, I would like to also uh, reply to one of the questions that I've seen uh, at the beginning. What, um, uh, what is being done to reconnect all those populations? Um, um, nothing really with the aim of reconnecting them, but what is being done uh, through the national um, uh, large carnivore uh, management policies is to 
um, particularly wolves are in Annex 2 and, and 4 of the habitat directives in, in uh, European Union countries, um, is to ensure that they can expand um, and um, uh, keep at favourable conservation status. So, for example, in the Alps, the connection between the Balkan population, the Alpine population, and uh, expansion uh, through um, towards Spain is naturally occurring. Okay. Thank you, Valeria. Um, so I've seen that you have been uh, talking among yourselves, but no other questions directed to our presenters today, because we might have the five last minutes for any uh, final questions. Okay, there is a question for Tono, but let me just, while yeah. you are writing your questions, uh, let me just tell you that um, indeed working in uh, effective communication is an important um, topic. How can we engage the wider audience? For example, I remember you mentioned in your presentation, Valeria, that you are also working with journalists, with media. How can we um, differentiate or change the information that is passing on uh, through media? And especially focus on this topic, we will have a workshop at Europar Conference in Scotland um, between the 18th and the 21st of September this year, and we will um, exactly examine uh, the fear versus, uh, versus facts. So um, we will look at effective communication as a means to improve the coexistence with large carnivores in protected areas. So this might be a good opportunity for you to come over and discuss it uh, a little bit. We will look at concrete examples and some practical activities, the human perception versus the large carnivorous ecology, the fear versus facts, the information and awareness, awareness raising versus sensationalism and emotions. So it might be a good opportunity to come over. More information will be um, soon released. So let's uh, go for the final round of questions. There was one for Tonu. Yeah. Nick asked, uh, is, uh, is our manual uh, available in the other countries? Unfortunately, it's now only in, in Estonian, but it is, uh, okay, uh, if you send me your, your contact, I give you the, uh, the, the place where, uh, site where it is, uh, put it in the web, it is, uh, it is available in the web in our, my institution, uh, website also. Unfortunately, okay. it is only in Estonia now. Um, let's do something. As, um, there is a lot of people asking about numbers. Uh, maybe I will ask you all participants and also the presenters to send us directly uh, their numbers and I will make them available on our website. So please write them to office at Europark.org and um, we can have a kind of platform where you can find all this information in our website. So this is uh, the email where you can write them, please. Okay, meanwhile, um, are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, they get it, okay, there oh, yeah. is Balint Baski asking you, Tono, they get it anyway and government supports proactive action? like France building program? I don't really understand the question. I also didn't act, actually didn't understand the, the, the question, but... Okay, so we'll wait uh, for them to ask again. Uh, farmers need to do proactive wolf attack prevention to get compensation. That's the question. Uh, do farmers need to be proactive uh, on wolf attack prevention to get the compensation? Actually, uh, today in in uh, today's running uh, running system, uh, they didn't uh, didn't be proactive. Or actually, there is a small tricky tricky things. It is written in the in the paper that uh, that uh, in the law paper that uh, yeah, uh, as I told or explained, we pay hundred percent. Of the damages we pay for the compensate to the, to the farmers, and we can take from from the or, uh, from the whole of the sum of the damages per year. We can take only this so-called farmer responsibility. It is a 
it is a uh, sum between 64 to 120 128 euros it is too small this uh, so-called farmers responsibility how to say sum to uh, we can uh, take from the from the general compensation uh, compensation money to move the farmers to be more proactive this means that we are now running in the in the uh, our bodies uh, this discussion that uh, actually we must have some extra tool to raise farmers to be more proactive as as in in usual but it is it is very very distributed or very common case that uh, that it is very easy unfortunately very easy to say farmers that uh, just to cut the subsidy for the uh, for the depredated uh, sheep they got quite good money and this means that they didn't worry about the future of the sheep or the future of the marketing or selling of the sheep so they they cut from us this so-called wolf payment and uh, and they are they are happy this means that we in the conservation bodies we are we try and like to move more toward the conditions that the farmers must have more and clear proactive measures do got the subsidy or do got the full full subsidy okay i can add it's something okay. from italy about this sure sure Valerie, go ahead um we uh, we have different uh, uh, regulations at regional level but tuscany region has uh, issued uh, um, a regulation in 2014 whereby the first attack um, is uh, compensated even without any damage prevention measures but the second attack uh, can com be compensated only at the presence of damage prevention measures they do provide uh, subsidies for, for damage prevention measures uh, through either um, uh, rural development funds or regional funds Problem is that it's um, mostly uh, self-declared, so there are no means of um, actually checking the efficacy of uh, the damage prevention measures in place. And, and I think this is where we actually made uh, a step forward through the network project. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's move just for this question. What about the coexistence of wolves and hunters? Are the wolves protected, Valeria? Well, the wolves are protected for sure. But yeah. what is the, the relationship between them uh, and hunters? Well, wolves uh, in Italy are not a huntable species. So um, the, the only uh, conflict uh, that could arise is um, uh, their hunting pressure on, on the um, uh, game species, namely uh, wild boar and, um, and roe deer, um, less extensively on uh, large and blood like red deer. Um, and we also have fallow deer. Um, um, I must say that uh, the conflict with hunters in peninsular Italy is not that high. Uh, hunters, hunters' number have decreased. Um, significantly over the last decades um, uh, and um, the, the, the numbers of wild boar uh, uh, are so high that um, for the moment there are no uh, real issues. It is probably different uh, in the Alps where the uh, hunting culture is uh, much, uh, much more deeply rooted and uh, the, the population of ungulates is lower so there might be some some issues but the, the population of wolves in the alps is still uh expanding and not at such a high levels mm -hmm. um there was a question here about golden jackals yeah um what you have to say about this valeria oh uh, we, we only have few jackals in italy just coming from the balkan peninsula uh, from, I mean, from the Balkan area, and um, um, uh, apparently, mm, 
the, the, there are more data from uh, Greece um, where the, the species has been abundant uh, for many uh, decades. Um, there is at the moment not much to report. Uh, usually um, they, they prey on, uh, on small species. Um, but I have not enough data really to, uh, to satisfactorily answer this question. Mm -hmm. Appointment or the, the remark by Nick uh, related to the golden chuckles, it is absolutely right as, uh, as I can, can give the comment uh, to this that uh, in Estonia as the golden chuckle is just newcomer or, or just uh, he, they arrived some four five years ago but today today in the last summers the golden chuckle depredation or damage numbers they are higher than for example the lynx numbers this means that the golden chuckle the, as they stay uh, and uh, take uh, just coastal areas which are which, which are very popular or traditional uh, traditional sheep uh, farming areas this coastal grasslands in Estonia and as well as golden chuckle like this kind of habitats or areas and uh, we didn't have absolutely correct data but at least some 30 40 50 individuals of sheep are or depredated or damaged or, or yeah, wounded, uh, wounded by the jackals, uh, jackals. and uh, until now we didn't, uh, we didn't compensate and we didn't uh, manage well with this kind of real conflict or real problem. Mm -hmm. So there might be space for a discussion for a future webinar on uh, other species such as the wolverine or the golden jackal. The golden sure. jackal. So, okay, um, it's time to finish our webinar today. I've seen the discussion is still very active. I'm really uh, grateful for that. Um, I will make um, an effort to provide you with all the links that have been shared throughout the chat box so you uh, can uh, keep a track on all conversations. Um, and meanwhile, let me just uh, say thank you very much to Valeria and Tonu. Um, it was really great to have you here today and to hear your experience. Um, today we had the governmental and the NGO perspective, but I, um, I assure you that we will come back again with another webinar uh, organized in a partnership with the EU platform. Uh, maybe uh, about uh, relationship behavior and uh, citizen science um, and how to approach uh, this topic with the uh, larger community. But meanwhile, go ahead and send us your thoughts, your thoughts and your suggestions for the coming webinars. Um, and let me just give you a final call for another very interesting conference that will happen in Germany in September between the 16th and the 19th. Uh, it's the Human Dimensions of Wildlife. It has been also announced uh, here before. Um, so this will be uh, a right, I guess, uh, spot to um, to discuss and elaborate uh, more on new solutions for our better coexistence between people and large carnivores. So two important events, the Human Dimensions of Wildlife and Eagle Park Conference Workshop. Thank you all for your participation. Valeria Tonu, thank you very much. Um, and thank I you. hope to see you soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye.